Good morning, everyone. Today, uh, we have a special guest faculty, Dr. Ajay Yadav, who is an associate professor in medical oncology with us here at the Mahatma Gandhi Medical College uh, Hospital. I have requested him to uh, tell us about the role on and importance of tumor markers and GI malignancies. I think this is a very important topic for students because whenever you get a case of GI or HPV malignancy, you will be asked at some stage whether you will do tumor markers or not and uh, why would you do it, what is their importance. And uh, usually in theory exam also, there is uh, almost always a short note related to tumor markers. So uh, I would now request Dr. Ajay Yadav to tell us about tumor markers. Thank you, sir. Good morning, all respected teachers and dear friends. So today we will discuss about tumor markers in GI malignancy. So my question is to one of our resident can answer this question, which is the correct statement about CES. Serum CES is a prognostic marker for colorectal carcinoma. It is a predictive marker. It is a prognostic but not predictive. It is a prognostic and predictive marker. Okay. So it will be easier for me to discuss in a already learned group. So in the next 15 to 20 minutes, we will discuss about the definition of tumor markers. What are the uses of tumor markers? The properties of ideal tumor markers. What are the different types? And some important tumor markers that we clinically use in our clinical practice. We will not discuss the rare tumor markers. Uh, those are under clinical trials. We will dis focus on the markers which are important in clinical practice. So tumor markers are the substances that are made by cancer cells or other normal cells in the body in response to cancer. This can be found in the blood urine, stool, tumors, or other body tissue or fluids. The tumor markers are usually proteins in chemical nature. And there are certain genetic markers that are being used uh, nowadays for decision making in the malignancies in metastatic as well as in adjuvant setting. So why these tumor markers are important? because they have they help in diagnosis of the malignancies they tell us about the outcome of disease they are uh, prognostic markers they help in monitoring the treatment when we are treating a patient with chemotherapy or targeted therapy they help us in detection of recurrence after surgery when patient is cured and uh, there are some markers that help about for in the screening of the tumors also so, what are the properties of an ideal tumor marker? The tumor marker should be specific, means it should be specific, specific for the particular cancer. It should have high sensitivity, means even if the size of tumor is very less, we should be able to detect these markers in the blood. It should correlate with the uh, level of the tumor size. And it should be cost effective and it can be measured easily in the practice. So, two important types of tumor markers are prognostic markers and predictive markers. Prognostic markers means they provide information about the overall cancer outcome and they don't help in decision making for the treatment. And predictive markers are the markers that help in decision making for the treatment. That this particular drug will work or not. Next, some important tumor markers that are, we are using in the clinics. First, colorectal cancers. There are two types of uh, markers we are using in co colorectal cancers. The markers that are found in the blood and the tumor markers that are detected on the tumor tissue. Carcino embryonic antigen, that is CEA, is the most commonly used marker in the clinics. And this is classic tumor marker for colorectal cancers. This is a glycosylated cell surface glycoprotein that is shedded by tumor cells. And it is used before surgery, we use 
for uh, to predict the prognosis if patient is have having higher level of ca then prognosis is poor during therapy to assess the response to treatment if we are giving new adjuvant chemotherapy or we are treating a metastatic disease this help in uh, assessing the response to the therapy and after completion of therapy or surgery we use it as a marker of recurrence frequently after uh, curing the patient on follow up we advise for ca and if it is rising we confirm the recurrence with the radiological imaging and then we treat accordingly so the question is that can ca be used as a screening marker for colorectal cancer the answer is no because it has low ability to detect the primary colorectal cancers and the low sensitivity for early stage disease in a meta analysis it was found that sensitivity of ca for diagnosis of colorectal cancer was only 46% so next question is is it specific for colorectal cancer the specificity of ca is also limited the specificity specificity is for diagnosis of colorectal cancer is around 90% and there are some situations where uh, ca is increased and these are these are the other malignancies where ca is raised it can be breast cancer lung cancer pancreatic cancer and medullary thyroid carcinoma where we use it as a marker of recurrence and uh, prognosis also so there are some non cancerous conditions where ca may be raised and these are gastritis peptic ulcer disease liver disease diabetes and the level is significantly higher among the cigarette smokers and the cut off level is higher for these smokers so this is the normal range for uh, non smokers it should be less than 2.5 nanogram per ml and for smokers the cut off is slightly higher this is less this it should be less than 5 nanogram per ml so after surgery and completion of adjuvant uh, chemotherapy or radiotherapy uh, what should be the frequency of cea so the maximum chance of recurrence is during initial 2 or 3 years so in the initial 2 years the frequency should be at 3 to 4 months and if there is no recurrence we can increase the frequency to 6 months or yearly these are the markers detected on tumor tissue for colorectal carcinoma and these are msi keras and ras and bras so what is microsatellite instability uh, in msi the short tandem repeats of the dna are very prone to mutation and it is due to dna mismatch repair system deficiency because of germline or somatic mutation in mismatch repair genes msi testing is used to classify the colorectal cancer into msi high or msi low msi high or mmr deficient tumors have better prognosis than the patients that are wild type msi how can we test this msi msi can be tested by ihc or it can be tested by pcr or ngs directly so in ihc we detect the mmr gene deletion uh, indirectly uh, we detect these four proteins mlh1 mss2 mss6 and pms2 these four proteins are indirect measures of this uh, msi if these mmr protein expression is absent the tumor is known as deficient mmr if they they are present then uh, this is known as proficient or low msi so next question is what is the significance of this msi testing msi testing should be done in all stages of colorectal cancer because it help in uh, decision making in early stage cancer also and in metastatic setting also so in early stage cancer after surgery stage in stage 1 there is no need to give adjuvant therapy to the patient in stage 3 the chances of recurrence are higher so we have to give adjuvant chemotherapy in stage 2 if the patient is having high risk features 
only those patients need adjuvant chemotherapy and what are the these high risk features if the, there is t4 disease there is obstruction or perforation there is inadequate lymph node dissection when less than 12 lymph nodes are dissected lvi or pni is positive there is close margin or it is positive margin and poorly differentiated histology these are the risk factors uh, that are seen before decision making for adjuvant therapy so how msi affect the decision if these high risk features are present then we have to give adjuvant chemotherapy and if these patients have msi high with uh, these high risk features then 5 fu is usually not effective in these patients uh, th these tumors are resistant to 5 fu so we give additional toxicity to these patients if we treat them with 5 fu but if msi is low then 5 fu is effective and we treat them with the uh, 5 fu based regimes how th this msi testing helps in metastatic colorectal cancer if msi is high then uh, pembrolizumab that is checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapy we can give in the second or third line after progression on chemotherapy if msi is low then there is no benefit of giving pembrolizumab and even in first line setting the role of this pembrolizumab is coming and this is the trial kinot 177 this was a phase 3 trial that compared pembrolizumab with the chemotherapy in chemo naive patients these are all metastatic newly diagnosed cases of uh, colorectal cancer who are having msi high or deficient mmr and the primary endpoint was overall survival and pfs secondary endpoint were overall response rate and uh, the safety of the drug so these are the results here we can see that the curves were separate from the beginning and there was significant improvement in pfs in the patients who were treated with pembrolizumab the cr rate partial response it all were higher in the pembrolizumab arm when they were com we compared with chemotherapy and this is the overall survival curve the overall survival was significantly improved with pembrolizumab so this was about msi now keras and ras and braf mutation all ras mutations are present in around 40 to 50% cases of colorectal cancer and the highest uh, percentage is for keras it is around 40% and around 5% cases are positive for n ras braf is present in around uh, 8 to 10% of cases and what is their clinical significance if keras or n ras are mutated they are mutated uh, then there is no benefit of adding these biological agents cetuximab and penetumumab uh, they are effective only in the uh, cases that are wild for keras and andras <coughs> and for braf braf is also a poor prognostic marker and they are less responsive to these egfr uh, therapies and these patients can be benefited with the braf directed therapy including bimurafenib and immunotherapy including pembrolizumab now we come to the stomach in stomach uh, again in blood we have markers ca ca help in uh, monitoring the response to the therapy and the, the recurrence on tumor tissues we do msi testing like in colorectal cancer and if it is positive then in second or third line we can use pembrolizumab and next important marker is her2 new her2 new this is a transmembrane glycoprotein located on chromosome 17q and this is the most uh, important amplified oncogene in gastric cancer around 20% cases of gastric adenocarcinoma are positive for her2 and her2 targeted therapy uh, has been established in the these patients having metastatic disease trastuzumab that is commonly used for breast cancer uh, it it was tested in toga trial in these gastric cancer patients 
in metastatic gastric cancer who were positive for her2 positive the patients were randomized to receive chemotherapy alone or chemotherapy plus trastuzumab the primary endpoint was overall survival and there was significant improvement in the overall survival 11.8 months with the chemotherapy alone and it was 16 months with the, the, this trastuzumab combination so next is cancer antigen uh, 99 that is ca99 ca99 is most clinically useful marker for early detection and surveillance of ca pancreas this is a ca related levis a blood group antigen a good diagnostic marker with sensitivity and higher sensitivity and specificity around 80 to 90% but the important uh, the problem is that it has low positive predictive value so it is a poor biomarker for screening of uh, ca pancreas <laughs> ca99 may be undetectable in levis antigen negative individuals and the normal level is less than 39 nanogram per liter this is current nccn recommendation for ca99 for pancreatic carcinoma and gall bladder and cholangiocarcinoma patients we should do the level at baseline after new adjuvant treatment prior to surgery and following surgery immediately prior to adjuvant therapy and after treatment for surveillance we usually do it at 3 to 4 month interval there are some other malignancies and benign conditions where ca99 is raised and these are cholangiocarcinoma hepatocellular carcinoma colorectal carcinoma some esophageal and stomach cancers lung and breast cancers it is it can also be raised in pancreatitis cholecystitis cirrhosis heavy t consumption endometriosis and teratomas next is promogranin a promogranin a is a glycoprotein secreted by neuron and neuroendocrine cells uh this is used for neuroendocrine tumors and its level correlates with progression and response to the treatment it has high sensitivity and specificity the sensitivity range from 32 to 92% and specificity is 10 to 96% several medications like ppi and uh, some food in falsely increases the level of the serum promogranin level and there are some other conditions where cg level is increased and these are some endocrine diseases like hyperparathyroidism hyperthyroidism pheochromocytoma pituitary tumors medullary thyroid carcinoma uh, gastrointestinal disorders like chronic atrophic gastritis chronic hepatitis colon cancer hepatocellular carcinoma pancreatitis and liver cirrhosis some non gi diseases including uh, breast cancer ovarian cancer prostate cancer small cell lung cancer and neuroblastoma uh, they also have higher level of cga <coughs> so tumor marker for hepatocellular carcinoma alpha fetoprotein is frequently used for tumor marker for uh, hepatocellular carcinoma with the sensitivity of 40 to 65% and specificity of 80 to 94% if the cutoff value is taken 20 nanogram per ml the positive rate of ap in hcc is only 60 to 80% and it is falsely positive during pregnancy active liver disease embryonic tumors certain gastrointestinal tumors uh, and the low sense low sensitivity has its limitation small hepatic tumors result in ap expression uh, being lower than the limit of detection so ap can be used for screening in the high risk patients means patients who are hbs antigen positive but in routine practice we can't use it as a screening marker for whole population next is gastrointestinal stromal tumor gist for this we have some tumor uh, driver mutations that should be advised uh, routinely and these include kit mutation and PD, pg pdgfra kit mutation is present in around 75 to 80% cases and exon 11 is the most common mutation that is found 
and uh, these uh, patients who have exon 11 mutation they respond well to the tkis exon 9 is second most common mutation and these patients uh, they are slightly less responsive to the target to these uh, tkis exon 13 and 17 these are uh, less common exon 13 shows uh, good response and exon 17 they are less responsive to imatinib <laughs> PDGFR is present in around 8 to 10 percent of cases, and even if it is present, around one third of cases respond to the uh, currently available TKIs, including imatinib, sunitinib, and ragorafenib. Two third cases of PDGFR mutation do not respond to these TKIs; they are resistant. And uh, the particularly D842V mutation. this mutation is resistant to all these three tkis that are available for treatment and uh, for these patients we have recently got a new approval evapritinib this is the next generation tki that was approved in 2022 for the patients who have d842b mutation so these are the different mutations found in gist and other gi malignancies Uh, a lot of tumor markers are on the way under trial that may come in the next couple of years with this i end the presentation and the take home message is that tumor markers have long been utilized for monitoring of gi malignancies with variable success certain tumor markers are mandatory in management of patient with gi malignancies biological and molecular markers are very helpful in decision making for targeted therapy and immunotherapy and the treatment can be individualized on the basis of these markers and more sensitive markers are needed for screening of cancers in future thank you thank you for thank you dr rajesh thank you very much uh, uh, just uh, one or two points i would like to add that <clears throat> when you have a cystic uh, pancreatic neoplasm then estimation of uh, tumor markers in the cyst fluid also is a very useful uh, investigation uh, uh, can you uh, tell us about uh, this fecal uh, screening for colorectal cancer which is very popular uh, at least in the western world fecal dna and uh, so will that also be considered as a tumor marker sir are we talking about uh, cell free dna yes. in the yes yes in the stool uh, as the, the uh, stool occult blood for stool that is, has been used for uh, detection of colorectal cancer the detection of uh, cell free dna or uh, these uh, tumor cells in the fecal matter this is more sensitive but we need more expertise for uh, the man means testing is difficult in our setting so it will take time for our labs to be prepared for this test we can use in the future so there are some questions on the chat Okay, there is a question. Is there any theoretical explanation why pembrolizumab works with deficient MMR tumors other than trial evidence? So, if the uh, patient is having wild type, uh, this wild means the, the patient is having MSI high. Then the, the, usually the uh, immunotherapy, the principle of basic principle of immunotherapy is. that usually they work better in where the mutation load is higher and if there is mutation in the, these genes and they are deficient then immunotherapy is uh, effectively kills the tumor cells that is the only reason <coughs> does uh, deficient mmr tumors recruit more tumor immune cells yes this is right for a cell of liver PIVKS tumor marker has only roles any role. Sir, so, uh, this I don't know. Can you comment? Jaswant, you would like to say something? Pipka. 
No, it says that uh, as well of liver, pipka is a tumor marker. Yeah. So in that case, pipka will be a supplement to AFP. And it will be more useful if there is macrovascular information to find out whether or not it is in fact benign. So you are saying if there is a tumor thrombus, then PIPCA level is going to be high. If it is a bland thrombus, then PIPCA will be normal. Another thing is that in case of hepatobiliary diseases, we usually do PDC 19.9. And now we are we were talking regarding the addition of carcinoma and make antigen with and people usually do C99 with CEA. So, what is the rationale behind this? Yeah. There are some cases where C99 is not elevated. In those cases, it is uh, there is possibility that the CA may be raised and we can use it as a marker for response. But many times we have seen that uh, in patients with uh, higher CA99, still the patient having benign pathologies. And as we have seen, uh, many, uh, yeah, that is the diseases. limitation of this market. Right? We have uh, many diseases where C99 is raised. It is not specific for this because many tumors are uh, tumors are not not producing C99 at the same time. But then uh, our patient has some cholangitis. In cholangitis, we usually have a higher C99. C99. That is, its sensitivity is low. Okay, professor, there are two types of tumors. Metastatic colorectal cancers, those those are uh, where the CA is normal. Yes, it is not elevated. Second thing we are telling about CA and CA99. Now, uh, what oncologists feel that CA and CA99 both are markers for malignancy of polyphenols. So, CA is not that sensitive and CA99 is relatively more sensitive. But if either of them is positive, then they take it for that. Now, they can use it for prognosis. What we use is different. We use it for diagnostic factors. Our relevance is different as compared to what oncologists are. Oncologists use it for prognostication in the post operative period. We use it for diagnosis. For diagnosis, it may not be a very good idea to use it. So there's a difference in our approach and their approach always. Because they will be using it because they use chemotherapy and then to follow it with the same yeah. marker. Prognosis as well as yes. the response to the therapy. We use it for diagnosis, which is not a correct thing. Third thing, we are telling something, sir, was saying about uh, C99 in the <laughs> so, a patient is having a uh, cystic lesion in the lesser sac, 10 cm size cyst, and now the patient has been aspirated fluid, 700 ml of fluid has been aspirated, CA99 is 1,000 to 1,000. That denotes malignancy. That denotes malignancy. <clears throat> now the patient has got a fluid which has been aspirated, now the volume is 50 ml now, and then over a period of the next three months, patient again gets a volume of 400 ml. Patient has again been aspirated, and now again he has a CA99 of 1300. Now, 
it is again it, it does not appear to be any cystic mass region in the pancreas it does not appear to be in the liver it does not appear in the stomach there is a fluid direction in the lesser <laughs> If you want, I can show the CT scan also. If you want, you would like to comment on CT scan. <laughs> the, the same patient, he has been evaluated many times outside. So there are some other uses where tumor markers are now used. That is, uh, uh, if you have a very high level of tumor marker, that may be an indication of PET scan. If otherwise, it is not there in your routine protocol in some malignancies, uh, then. Um, uh, same uh, is for staging laparoscopy that if routinely you don't do staging laparoscopy, if you have a very high, say, for example, CA99 level in pancreatic head cancer, then even if your routine protocol doesn't include staging laparoscopy, these patients, you may do staging laparoscopy because yield is going to be higher for detecting undetected metastasis. Also, it is being used for neoadjuvant treatment that if the CA99 level is very high, then that may become an indication. So in the definition of borderline resectable pancreatic cancer, where earlier we used only anatomical, radiological features, now um, uh, both the uh, overall performance status of the patient as well as biology of the tumor. And biology of the tumor is detected uh, or uh, uh, classified by tumor marker level or the FDG avidity on PET scan. So tumor marker levels are being used to indicate new adjuvant treatment also in uh, borderline resectable pancreatic cancer. And as Dr. Ajay mentioned that uh, chromogranin A is a very good marker for neuroendocrine tumors. So whenever based on radiological imaging, you suspect a neuroendocrine tumor, that means brightly enhancing lesion in the arterial phase, then uh, serum chromogranin level, uh, both for uh, uh, kind of uh, reaffirming the diagnosis and also for prognostication and response to treatment. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, US guided uh, aspiration of the fluid in a cystic pancreatic neoplasm. So there are some features which classify a cystic pancreatic neoplasm as worrisome features. And worrisome features uh, based on uh, radiological imaging indicate further investigation. And further investigation in these patients is always US guided FNAC. Uh, which includes estimation of uh, tumor marker, especially CEA, not CA99. CEA is more important in the fluid uh, to say whether uh, it is going to be malignant or not. Ajay, you were saying something. I mean, I want to show that it is when I just visited somehow. Uh, this, uh, this patient has not undergone a CEA. My impression was also that you should always get in the fluid a CEA level as well as the mucin content. They are more important markers, and neither of the two has been done by how far this tumors. Seeing this patient, they've got a USB guide aspirin twice. Now, how to proceed? Should we reset this cyst en masse? Because that is not in the pantheon. If it was in the pantheon, we could have resected. If it was in the liver, we could have resected. Now, this is in the lesser sample. Now, how to proceed with it? So, I think we should go for surgery. Go for uh, resection only and en masse resection only. Whatever is the surrounding structure, we will take it en masse. Because here, I did a thousand people. <coughs> So does AFP level depend on the dif differentiation of SCC? SCC, yes. Another question? Question number. 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 Question so, do we need to confirm with the FNAC or biopsy in all cases, or we can go for surgery? For a carcinoma, we never get a FNAC. For a carcinoma, head of the pancreas, first of the pancreas, try to establish the diagnosis if it is possible, but it is not mandatory. Even if it is negative, we can go ahead with resection. And even if at the end of resection, you will find the biopsy to be negative. Then, if your institution, your institution, you have a low mortality, you can definitely go into the surgery. But if you are in an institution where you are doing less than five reports in a year, then I don't think you should go into the resection in this case. Then you should refer it to a center which can have a lower mortality because if the biopsy comes to be negative and the patient has a mortality, then it is definitely a worrisome uh, area for the for the doctor. So your institution, you should have a lesser mortality rate and a lesser mortality rate and good numbers being done. Then you should then attempt the patient who are having negative tissue. Yeah, so students, two very important points which Dr. Ajay made that in gallbladder, if the 
lesion, whatever it is, thick wall GB, mass, polyp, is resectable, then we don't get, we don't advise an FNAC to be done. So that is why, for the purpose of diagnosis, the, the surgical groups do not use tumor marker levels. But from the oncologist's point of view, for uh, follow up, for chemotherapy, for assessing response to chemotherapy, they are important. So that is why. Many surgical groups have included it in their protocol, pre-operative tumor markers level, but we don't use them to make a diagnosis. Diagnosis is based on radiological ground. If the lesion is resectable, we will resect it, even if it turns out to be negative. And we know that when we do an extended cholecystectomy with a radiological suspicion of gallbladder cancer, one out of 10, one out of 20, depending on where you are working, cases will finally turn out to be benign, either xantho or just chronic cholecystitis. But that is acceptable. Because if you insist on a tissue diagnosis in every case, then you will miss some of the resectable lesions and there is definite theoretical risk of needle drag implantation. So that is as far as gallbladder is concerned. For pancreas or periampillary, as Dr. Ajay said, that we make every possible attempt for which we have the facilities. So that starts with endoscopic, uh, side viewing endoscopy and biopsy and then US guided FNAC, but never a percutaneous FNAC. So if the lesion is resectable, we will never do a percutaneous FNAC for the same reason. And we will go ahead with resection on clinical and radiological uh, suspicion alone. But as he pointed out, before you do that, counseling of the patient and family and the fact that your results should be acceptable is very important. Because if you land up in an unfortunate situation, the patient has a mortality and finally the diagnosis shows no malignancy, then it can become a serious medical legal issue. Uh, role of new adjuvant in uh, carcinoma pancreas. What are you doing? We are giving in selected patients, but uh, the conversion rate is not so high. Uh, the maximum benefit is with uh, three drug regime, four very <laughs> nox. We have to combine arenotican based regime and auxiliary platin based regime both. And for this regime, the patient's general condition should be very good. Otherwise, toxicities are higher. With, we are a little afraid for the toxicities. So, do you want to say that the patient who is having a locally advanced lesion, that is, he is having the photovoltaic SMA close to the tumor, that is the group which will give a new adjuvant, or the patient is having a lymphomotor disease, only that will give, or you prefer now that all the patients who are having a periamperi should get a new no, 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 not for all the patients. We uh, try to push towards the surgeon. Uh, if it is borderline, then we give new adjuvant treatment. If patient is in condition, is very good. Yes, this I just said. Uh, but but the tumor is radiologically less than 3 cm. And, and the uh, uh, senior 99 is uh, uh, very high. They are now being suggested that you can improve them with a, a, a new treatment. Yeah, that's what exactly yesterday yeah. we were having a discussion in one of our uh, close groups. And uh, the, there, there is a trend now that which is going towards uh, for the for the head of pancreas muscles, even if they are receptible, they tend to go towards the new treatment because most of these patients which appear to be receptible, on table you find that it is a difficult dissection because they might be that the region is small, but they might be a desoplastic reaction near to it. So there is a trend. So therefore, I wanted to ask this question. There is not yet established guideline. Yes. Except for the Tata Memorial, which has published recently the data on uh, new instrument for periamplary, no other group is presently uh, going ahead with that, with that uh, new instrument. Yes, this is not like breast cancer where we have a higher rate of response and we even if that tumor is resectable, we try to give systemic treatment first, then we go for cells. But here the response rate is not so high that uh, if we plan for chemotherapy, then we have to assess the patient frequently. After two cycles, we have to do imaging because there are high chances of progression on treatment also. The response rate is around 25 to 30 percent. So around 75 percent will eventually progress on the chemotherapy. Then we have to go for such. So if I'm not wrong, um, for, for head of pancreas and carcinoma gallbladder, the rear treatment is noted having an established road as for CA esophagus, CA stomach, and CA rectum. These are three areas which have an established role of new adjuvant. Yes. But CA gallbladder is still going towards a trend towards new adjuvant uh, still, and CA pancreas is also been, uh, going in the borderline case. Yes. 
that's i think that the message you yes. so again yeah we have to remember that in most indian centers most of the pds are for periampullary cancers not for ca head pancreas yeah. and that is that is for all of all no not so in PD, the, no because pd ultimately they end up in getting converted into a pd and that is a so whenever you want to use neo adjuvant treatment in a primarily resectable tumor this is one major uh, disadvantage that uh, either because of the toxicity of the neo adjuvant treatment the patient does not reach resection so something which was resectable doesn't get resected and second if the patient responds very well then patient feels that he or she is all right and doesn't come back so uh, both of the <laughs> factors are very important which uh, when you are conducting a trial of course you take into account and you look after these but when you apply the same thing in clinical practice it, it becomes a problem as far as unresectable or borderline resectable lesions are concerned yes at least in pancreas there is uh, definite evidence and almost all guidelines uh, indicate neo adjuvant treatment except that for portal vein involvement alone when it is not artery portal vein involvement alone some guidelines say even upfront surgery so they say that there is no need if you can do a venous resection and reconstruction then there is no need for uh, neo adjuvant treatment you can go for upfront surgery so anyway this is a separate topic in itself but students if you want a presentation on neo adjuvant and adjuvant therapy in pancreatic uh, cancer then recently one of my colleagues dr kalash kodia he has done a very good review of the subject with me so then uh, if you just send a message to dr anand whether you would like to have that then i can request kalash to make that presentation because he has done an extensive review of the literature and guidelines and that would be a good uh, topic uh, for you to so if i if anand receives a good number of responses saying yes then we will have that so with that i think we will close this session once again i would like to thank dr ajay yadav for accepting our request to uh, make this presentation and uh, thank you thank you sir providing me this opportunity thank you we will close the session thank you Thank you.